So in this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, healthcare delivery systems and look at some of the goals that the government has set for some of these systems. The IOM is what you'll hear most people refer this to, but it's the Institute of Medicine. And they've listed six outcomes for a new health system for the 21st century. And what they're really looking at is how health systems are going to meet the needs of patients. And so what they've said is that these health systems need to be safe. They need whatever we're doing, it needs to be effective. We need to have efficient health care. Uh, it needs to be patient-centered, not bottom line economically centered, but patient-centered. It needs to be done in a timely manner. So think back to what we've been talking about with the uh, in the news with the VA and how people are waiting forever to be seen at the VA. That would not meet the IOM's outcomes for the new health systems for the 21st century because these veterans are not being seen in a timely manner. Also, we want to make sure that it's equitable. And when we say equitable, it means that the richest person is treated in the same way as the poorest person is, and that there's no priorities given to you because of, of your culture, or because of your race, or because of your socioeconomic status. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement have some basic big picture issues that they've identified in healthcare. For instance, access to healthcare. Are we meeting the needs of all of our communities, not just one or two of the groups? Also, quality and safety. Uh, this goes back to some of the things that we've talked about in the past as far as quality is concerned and whether or not we are providing the best evidence-based practice when caring for our patients or the population that we're caring for. Remember, nursing is not just in the hospital. It can, you can be a public health nurse, and in, as a public health nurse, you're dealing with populations of people rather than just individuals, although you're probably dealing with individuals as well in that role. Uh, when we look at safety, we look at things like, are we doing the best that we can to prevent falls when they're in the hospital? Are we making sure that when we do surgery that we're only removing the limb that is supposed to be removed and not uh, doing surgery on some other part of the body? Uh, also, affordability. What are we needing to do to keep costs down in healthcare? You know, in the United States, our healthcare is more expensive than any other uh, country in the, uh, that's a developed country. Uh, part of that has to do with socialized medicine in those countries, but there's other issues that are involved, um, such as the drug companies uh, making huge profits for their investors. So there's a lot of things in our country that affects the affordability of care. And so what can we do to, to make that more affordable for everyone? So this sort of builds on the things that we were talking about the other day uh, with evidence-based and research, because in a continuously learning healthcare system, we're going to be looking for ways of meeting the goals of the IOM and the IHI. And in doing that, we're going to be using things that we have available to us, such as science and informatics. We have the ability at times to have a real-time access to knowledge. We have the ability to go to our IT departments and say, can you pull up everyone who had this diagnosis that was admitted between January and October? 
And can you also add to that uh, had to have surgery uh, or had to be readmitted? And so then we can go back and we can review charts of people that had surgeries, had to be readmitted, and find out why they had to be readmitted. And that may tell, give us information to help adjust the way we uh, do care with those patients. Uh, we can also have a digital capture of the care experience because we can actually look and see how the care that we're giving uh, is happening as it's being given. Also, we can, we can have patient-clinician uh, partnerships. When patients are in a partnership with their providers, it gives our patients empowerment. I don't know, you know, some of you are, are young and you haven't had to go out and search for doctors on your own yet. Uh, others of you are uh, doing that yourselves. I know for myself, when I look for a new doctor, one of the things that I look for is, are you going to talk to me? Do you listen to me when I'm telling you things that are going on with me? Because I know my body better than you do. And if you're not going to listen to me and you're going to just kind of uh, have a cookbook way that you deal with different illnesses, I don't want you as my doctor. And so you could say I'm already an empowered patient. But if you want me to be engaged in my health care, you need to be talking to me. And so as nurses, we need to encourage our, our patients to look for providers that are going to, to listen to them and are going to be making decisions based on the information that they give to their providers. So we have to empower our patients to say, talk. Tell your, tell your provider what's going on. Tell them what you think is going on with you because this is going to help them to have a better patient-clinician relationship. There's incentives, and they're aligned with value. Um, insurance companies, uh, I, I would almost say that the incentives almost work in negatives uh, because if something happens, a, a hospital doesn't get reimbursed. So when a patient develops a infection in the hospital after they've had a surgery, of, and when we're talking about developing infections, we're talking about getting like wound infections, something like that, they will, the insurance company will pay for it. Uh, these secondary infections uh, for an otherwise healthy person, the insurance company says, hey, that's your fault, and you're going to have to swallow that cost. There's no reason why we should pay for something that's your error. Um, and so uh, we also see, that, see these incentives with physicians. And physicians, and this is one of those things that a lot of, of patient advocacy groups are really against because what happens is if they don't refer, uh, if the primary providers do not refer to specialists, then they are rewarded with extra pay by the insurance companies for not having sent their patients to specialists. Uh, and that becomes kind of tricky because are they affecting your health by not sending you on to somebody that really can care for you at, on a better level than what they are able to provide. We all have specialties and those specialties are the areas that we have increased knowledge in. And so our, this, this person who has a general knowledge of everything, not sending you to a specialist can be a uh, something that could cause lifelong problems for the patient. And so there's a problem with that. Full transparency really implies that you really know what's going on with your providers, that they are honest with you when they say, well, I would rather not send you to a, 
a uh, specialist because of XYZ, but they're never going to tell you that they're not sending you there because they're going to get extra money if they don't. And then the continuous learning culture. There is a, you know, this talks about leadership uh, instilled culture of learning. For nursing, we almost don't need leadership instilled cultures of learning because our state boards of nursing require us to, to have continuous education with every renewal of our license licensure. Not only that, but if you have a certification in an area that you work in, like if you work in the OR, there's, there's certifications for OR nurses. Uh, I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner. I am board certified. I've taken exams to show that I am fully qualified to do the job that I do. Uh, I have to renew that certification every year, every three years. Uh, before I became a nurse practitioner, I was certified as a neonatal intensive care nurse. Uh, this shows that I have taken the time to have extra uh, levels of education specifically for the area that I'm working in. Sometimes this leadership instilled culture of learning says, I'll pay you a little bit extra if you go on and get your certifications. Uh, other times it may uh, be that I'll send you to conferences. Um, so those are different ways that leadership can encourage their staff to be more uh, educationally uh, prepared. Not only that, but usually each hospital has specific educational um, activities that they want their nurses to do each year. And you, they're usually computer programs that they you log in, watch some videos, uh, take a small test after the, that. Uh, when I was working as a clinical nurse educator, that was what my job was, was to the, the hospital would send out all the safety things <clears throat> like fire safety and whatever else was the big thing that they wanted um, the whole system to learn. <clears throat> but within each unit, there were learning activities that we did as well. So I would have a group of videos or other learning activities that I had for labor and delivery. I would have another group of learning activities that I would come up with for the neonatal intensive care unit or for the antepartum unit or for the postpartum unit because that was the, I worked in the women's health area. So, <clears throat> That's another way that the organization encourages learning. Uh, and uh, this idea of that you're going to get help going to conferences or uh, be encouraged to be certified is part of the su supportive, supportive system competencies. So I mentioned just a little bit ago about uh, medical errors, and I specifically mentioned things like uh, making sure we do surgery on the right limb and things like that. Well, the Institute of Medicine uh, designed a strategy to prevent medical errors, and it has four parts to it. And one of the things that <clears throat> the, the IOM is uh, pointed out was the most common reason that you're going to die or have problems in the hospital is because of medical errors. Not because you've had a heart attack and you're dying, but because somebody made an error, gave you the wrong medication, did the wrong procedure on you, something like that. Medical errors are much more common than the public is aware of. And so one of their strategies to prevent errors is to establish a national focus to create leadership, research, tools, and protocols to enhance our knowledge about safety. These protocols and tools 
uh, help to prevent errors. So for instance, we used to, <clears throat> in the ICUs, we used to uh, order uh, dopamine, which is given by a drip, uh, and we would, most people had kind of a basic um, solution that they would order, but it could vary some from doctor to doctor. And so one of the things that they're doing now to help not make errors in the pharmacy or in on the unit as you're hanging dopamine is to have a basic solution of dopamine. So that it's always this many milligrams in this many milliliters of fluid. Uh, and so all the doctor is really writing for is how fast that solution is going to run. That decreases the risk of errors happening in the way they write it, in the way the pharmacist interprets the writing. One of the other things that we've done too is to do things uh, have the doctors have to type in their, their orders into the computer. Uh, over the years, there, there have been some of the most amazing interpretations for doctor's handwriting because we just plain couldn't read it. And so now with the doctors having to put in the medication themselves in a way that can be easily read, it means that there's less likely a chance that there's an error being made. Sometimes there's medications that they, their names are very similar. And so it could be interpreted either direction based on the handwriting that the doctor had. But that has been fairly eliminated <laughs> at this point by the doctors having to enter their orders into the computer themselves. The second uh, strategy is to identify and learn from errors by developing a nat nationwide public mandatory reporting system. Um, I haven't really gotten into this myself too much, but uh, errors are reported by the hospitals to this reporting system. And so, of course, they don't like to report that they're having errors in their, in their hospitals. So it's going to cause those hospitals to work harder to prevent errors. Also, raising performance standards and expectations for improvement in safety through the actions of oversight organizations, professional groups, and group purchasers of health care. This goes back to that, that comment that I made to you about infections. Because... If the, the group published purchasers of health care are the insurance companies. And so if you are, if your hospital has a higher incidence of hospital acquired infections, they're not going to want to deal with you and they are going to not pay that hospital as well when that hospital comes to them to negotiate payments. Um, because um, I know, like, uh, on your insurance, you know, there's the, the hospital that, that your insurance will pay the most for, and then there's the out-of-group um, uh, hospitals and doctors. And so your, hos your local hospital may be taken out of the preferred provider group because they have increased infections or they don't have as good of results. And that can be your professional groups as well. On the other side of that, the professional groups in your local area may feel that that insurance doesn't pay well enough for their care. And so they refuse to deal with them. Uh, I still see one of my doctors in Kentucky and my son still lives up there. And so since it's something, um, it's my eye doctor. And so since I, I don't need to see my eye doctor more than once a year, I just kind of go up there and have my eye doctor see me. Of course, she encourages me to find somebody down here to see, see me. But um, I'm comfortable with her. And uh, I have another doctor up there that I hadn't found a doctor to refer 
to replace that doctor yet. And um, I called up the doctor's office because I was going to be up there. And I said, you know, I really need to have a follow up on this. Uh, can But I've moved. And can I get in and see her while I'm up visiting? And they said, well, what insurance do you have? Uh, well, the insurance that I have here at Southwestern, they don't accept that insurance because up in Kentucky, they don't get paid as well by them. So you have both issues going on with purchasers of health care. Oversight organizations are things like the Joint Commission um, it used to be called JCO, uh, and they would come in and do inspections of the hospital to see whether or not you were really uh, providing the best care for your patients. Uh, the fourth uh, strategy that the IOM suggested was implementing safety systems in healthcare organizations to ensure safe practices. So these are things like preventing falls. And so in preventing falls, we do an assessment when the patient first comes in to find out who is at risk for having falls. And then we put a special colored band on them. We also have them wear a special colored uh, sock that has grips on the bottom of it. Of course, all the socks that we give our patients have grips, but... Um, these are yellow, and the yellow socks tell us that this person is at risk for falls. It could be that their medication puts them at risk for falls. It could be that their um, diagnosis puts them at risk for falls. Uh, it could be that uh, a surgery that they're having puts them at risk for falls but they are at risk for falls and they are considered at risk the entire time that they're at the in the hospital and so this is a system that we've put in to help prevent that from happening so i think i've already given enough <laughs> uh, examples of these uh, these things and so I'm not going to spend any more time talking about those right now. So this is in your book and once you have access to your book you'll be able to see this uh, but this is uh, just a general pie chart showing uh, where the U.S. health dollar is spent. And you can see that 31% of the health dollar is spent in hospital care. But is all of the health, hospital care that we're giving appropriate? Are, do we have people utilizing our emergency rooms for clinic care, for instance, instead of going to the physician clinical services, which is still 20%? Really, it ought to be a high a higher percentage. Um, ideally, our hospital care should not be such a high percentage of our total health dollar. We ought to be doing things that are preventative to keep you out of the hospital. Uh, the other thing that you can see is 10% of our health dollar is spent on prescription drugs. And so we have to look at these things to say, where, where are we spending too much of our health dollar? So there's a number of strategies that different people have come up with in trying to reduce health care costs um, at the same time giving fair reimbursement. And then there's regulations that are related to these as well. So one is a prospective payment system. We call those DRGs. And those are called diagnosis, oh, I've forgotten the other words now, but the payment is based on the diagnosis. If 
And what they end up doing is they sort of take the top three that a patient might have. Because when they come into the hospital, really you're, you're primarily treating one thing, but there may be other things that are related to it. And so they'll, what they end up doing is they pay for that primary diagnosis for the, for the admission, and some of these other ones, they won't give any payment for those at all. Capitation and managed care says uh, you are going to only, you know, we're going to tell you how much we're going to pay. And if you spend more than that amount, you just aren't going to get paid for it. So that's where hospitals really start saying, you know, we're only going to get paid for X number of dollars for this diagnosis. And so you've got to keep the cost down. It's one of the reasons why we get very particular about wasting uh, supplies because you know in the old days you got paid for every when you got paid for everything there would be it didn't matter how many boxes of Kleenexes you used or how many uh, of our dressings we were using during a dressing change um, but now you've got to really watch that because they're only going to get paid a certain amount of money and they're trying to keep the cost down as much as possible. This also leads to us uh, sending patients home earlier. And so we don't see as many n not patients that are not really, really sick in the hospital. Uh, there's no sitting in the hospital for 24 hours before you get surgery because you're in there, you're getting your care, and you're getting out of there to, in order to decrease the amount of money the hospital is spending to take care of you during your admission. Bundled payments uh, basically say that for this admission, uh, your surgery, your post-op care, your hospital care, your pharmacy care within the hospital, radiology care is going to be this amount of money and that's all the insurance is going to pay. Everything is bundled into that uh, admission. So specifically, I'm more familiar with like a labor and delivery bundle. Uh, so a woman comes in in labor and her entire cost for her labor, the time that she's in labor, the delivery, um, whatever is used during the delivery costs, and then her post, uh, postpartum care is all bundled into one payment. And uh, you don't get all these little odds and ends kinds of bills like, oh, we used this many uh, bags of fluid or we use this many dressings and she had these pads for her postpartum care it's all bundled into one payment and so again it's one of those things where we try not to waste our resources because you know you're only going to get paid a certain amount of money rate setting uh, hospitals will set a rate but ultimately it's in negotiations with the insurance companies, uh, specifically Medicare, uh, that helps to decide what actually is going to end up being paid. If Medicare comes out and says, you know, we're going to pay some outrageously low amount for a certain diagnosis, the insurances may pay a little bit more than that, but they're not, they're going to base what they want to reimburse on what Medicare is saying that they're going to reimburse for adult care. Uh, and then we do a comparative effectiveness analysis where we may compare uh, between one unit and another. We may compare between one hospital or another to find out who's, who has the least amount of cost for the highest quality of care. And then um, there's an increasing patient cost sharing, that kind of goes along with these bundled payments. One patient, it may actually cost more for them while they're uh, admitted. So we go back to this labor and delivery example. We may have a woman who had postpartum bleeding 
And so she may use more supplies during her admission than somebody who came in and didn't have the problems with bleeding after um, delivery. So this person may not have had as high a uh, cost of supplies and staff to care for her, but this other one had higher ones. So between the two of them, it sort of averages out for the amount that they want to spend for them. So some of these things I've already referred to, but we'll go over them real quick. Uh, utilizing quality improvement tools to reduce waste and improve safety. Uh, I know that uh, within the organization that I was working in, often we would say, do you really need to use this when you're um, doing some procedure? And so back to that idea of, well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, maybe we don't need to be doing it that way. Uh, we used to have big giant trays that we would use to remove sutures. Um, now we can we know that we can remove su the the suture tray uh, that we have uh, has a two by two gauze uh, dressing in it, and it has the scissors to cut the the suture and a tweezers to pull them out with. And uh, there's not all of these drapes and everything that used to be in them. And so this is a way that we can reduce waste, but yet we still have quality care being given and we improve safety with it. Uh, we can uh, improve transitions across settings. So when somebody is admitted to an uh, emergency department, we improve the transition from the emergency department to the floor if they're being admitted to the floor. Uh, we make the delivery of medical services more efficient and less costly. We can see some of that um, with utilizing hospitalists in many hospitals. Uh, it used to be that the same doctor that you saw for primary care at home was the same doctor that you saw in the hospital. And that's not to say that that doesn't still happen. But in many cases, what they're finding is um, that primary care physicians are, re are referring patients into the hospital where they're, where they're followed by a hospitalist. The hospitalist keeps in contact with the primary care physician, and the primary care physician can spend their time with their patients in their office, while the hospitalist, who is used to seeing patients in the hospital on a daily basis, and um, more um, used to uh, dealing with situations that ha happen within the hospital is able to see the, the patient in the hospital. So it's more efficient and it's less costly uh, for the hospitalist to see the patient than the primary care physician. Uh, also eliminating unnecessary costs such as fraud and abuse so um, fraud may be that somebody says that um, uh, someone needs additional care, uh, maybe at the end of a surgery, and what they're actually doing is giving them a tummy tuck. And that's not part of you know, a tummy tuck is something that you get, you pay additional money for. And they just make it part of their appendectomy or they make it part of their C-section. And so that's fraud uh, when we do that. Um, also improving population health. When we improve the health of populations, we have less admissions to hospitals and we also have less need for prescription medications. If we can prevent illness, then we're not going to have to treat it. This idea, you know, there's a lot of people that will tell you that if we would spend more money on wellness, we would be spending less money on sick care. And uh, it is 
definitely something that has been shown to be true in the research. So one of the ways that the government decided to help people out and try to improve um, health care is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which is PPACA. Uh, we also know this is Obamacare. As you know, Obamacare, um, or at least portions of it, have been repealed uh, since it was first put in place. But uh, what it did was to expand coverage and uh, it was supposed to control health care costs and to improve health care delivery systems. Uh, it provided Medicaid or subsidized coverage to qualifying people with incomes up to 400% of the poverty level, and that began in 2014. It also provided a new way to get insurance, the health insurance marketplace, which is still in effect. And the marketplace was designed to help people uh, more easily find health insurance that fits their budgets. So there was no longer this thing of saying, well, I can't afford insurance. However, what I will tell you is that it was not as effective as what they thought it was going to be. And it certainly did not provide the level of care that they thought that it was touted to, to provide. And some of these lower cost insurances had very high deductibles in them or co-pays. And so really the people were no better off. And then as you recall, you were fined in your income tax if you were not covered by a health insurance policy. So you got punished no matter which side and it hit your pocketbook. And that, that was something that many people felt really was not fair. And there was a lot of memes that went around on Facebook and other social media that said, I couldn't afford, I couldn't afford insurance uh, before Obamacare. I can't afford it now. And now you're going to charge me for not being able to afford it. Uh, so there were definitely some issues that had to do with this. Uh, this is definitely something that's still being discussed within the country. And if you all want to have a discussion about this sometime along the line, uh, we can possibly figure out a time that we can discuss uh, some of the issues involved with affordable health care in, the, in this country. So when we look at healthcare delivery systems and care coordination, there's a number of people and groups that are involved in those. Uh, physicians and hospitals are part of the delivery system. Uh, so are multi-specialty group practices. There's some advantages to being involved in a multi-specialty group practice. Uh, however, something that you should know, and really we ought to educate our uh, patients about, is that just because a doctor that you see for primary care is in a multi-specialty group practice does not mean that you have to see the specialist that's within that, that group. And um, you could go, you are, as a patient, able to see any specialist that you want to be referred to. Uh, in many cases, insurances have changed so that it is no longer requ uh, required to have referrals to specialists, although the specialists themselves may require the referrals. Um, there's community health centers, and these community health centers uh, will take care of uh, primary care type uh, health needs of a community. Uh, there's also prepaid group practices where you pay up front and um, and then when you go in to see the groups, you pay a reduced amount of money. There's also something that uh, I don't think your book really talked about that's coming up that's sort of related to this prepaid group practice is that there is something that they're calling concierge um, practices. And what happens with those is you pay a fee to the doctor's practice. Um, it depends on the practice, 
how much it is. I've heard of some being up to $10,000 a year. Um, and uh, because you've paid this almost like a membership fee, uh, the doctor does not see as many patients. And because they don't see as many patients, when you call in saying, I'm sick, I need to be seen, they get you in the same day. Or, and you're given a special phone number for the doctor so that you can call that doctor and talk to the doctor 24-7. Uh, so that is uh, something that's kind of new over the last probably four to five years that's starting to come up. I actually had been seeing a doctor that I really liked. Uh, I had a good relationship with her. She was one of those doctors that uh, you better know ahead of time that you're going to be waiting to see her because she would take her time with you. And um, I knew that that was the case. So if I really needed to get in there and out of there, I wanted like the 1 p.m. appointment or the 9 a.m. appointment because I, I knew that the longer her day went in, the longer I was going to have to wait uh, to see her. She went into one of the concierge programs. And for her, um, I would have had to pay $1,500 a year to be able to have the privilege of seeing her. And in addition to that $1,500 a year, I still they, sh they still would have billed my insurance like a regular doctor's appointment. Uh, and the $1,500 would not have come out of my insurance. It would have come out of my own personal pocket. So that's something else to kind of think about that's different that I don't believe your book really talked about. HMOs, uh, basically, you only see the doctors that are within the HMO group. And so you have a primary care provider that uh, is the gatekeeper financially for the group. And they you see the primary care provider and they decide whether you need to see a specialist within that group or not. And that is part of this idea of uh, I'm, the insurance is not going to allow you to spend more than what they want. And the primary care physicians are paid to keep you from seeing uh, specialists. And the fewer specialists they refer to, the more they get paid. Uh, PPOs are uh, pro preferred provider organizations, and most insurance insurances are falling under this. And so you have preferred groups of physicians, clinics, outpatient surgery centers, hospitals that the insurance has um, negotiated lower uh, payments from. And if you go outside of that network, then you will pay a higher um, copay uh, on your care. Accountable care organizations are somewhat similar to that. Uh, medical homes to medical neighborhoods. Uh, this is kind of a new term that's uh, come out lately. A medical home is not that there's stuff uh, medically going on in the home. But what it is is that within your home, you have a, you either have a physician group or you have physicians for each one of your, your members of your family that are, that you have a good relationship with. And you are able to see these physicians and take care of your needs through that physician group. Uh, it may include pharmacies as well that you deal with one pharmacy consistently. So they know you, they know your allergies, they know everything about you as far as those things are concerned. And, um, and so your care is coordinated so that you are not getting unnecessary care. You're not inadvertently being given medications that um, don't work together. Uh, and so you really are getting good quality care. 
And so they're calling that now a medical home. Uh, medical neighborhoods implies that people that live within that area are also, also have this medic, their medical needs being met and, and met adequately to provide the highest level of wellness. So it is something, uh, a term that's being used. Uh, you can have people that do not have medical homes within a medical neighborhood. Um, but ideally, we want to see more medical homes being established. It's not unusual uh, for, I mentioned to you guys about Cook's 24-hour um, stay area asking people about um, their health literacy. What we found with that is that often people that are on uh, Medicaid, they, they aren't even aware who their doctor is that they're supposed to be seeing. And so on the back of their Medicaid card, it says your doctor is this person but they've never actually gone to that doctor's office. Or maybe they don't go to that doctor's office because that doctor, you know, they speak Spanish and nobody in that doctor's office speaks Spanish. Uh, and so part of this health literacy uh, initiative that they've taken on there at Cook's is to help the family establish medical homes for their children. And that may mean that they need to tell them about other doctors and help them get their doctor changed to a doctor that will meet their needs. And so uh, it's, it's really an interesting concept, uh, this medical home concept. So like anything, we can't uh, resist giving it levels. So there's levels of health care. Primary health care is the treatment of common health problems. Uh, this includes going in and getting your immunizations, your flu shots, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so this is what we say our primary health care provider. Your doctor that you go to when you come down with the flu and you need Tamiflu or you... Um, you just aren't feeling good and they're going to figure out what's wrong with you. A secondary health care is um, where we go for treatment of problems requiring more specialized clinical expertise. That's when you're seeing those specialist doctors when they may be referring you for MRIs or uh, CT scans or other kinds of of uh, lab work, things like that, that go along with figuring out um, the specialized, maybe more severe um, disease states. Tertiary health care is the management of rare and complex disorders. Those are also taken care of by specialists, but it may be a specialist within a specialty that cares for um, these types of patients. So we've been doing a lot of talk about, uh, about insurance and Medicaid and Obamacare uh, in the previous slides. Um, and basically that's um, issues involving paying for health care. There's out of out-of-pocket payment. And out-of-pocket payment is the most expensive way of paying for health care. Uh, I mentioned to you the other day about going to that clinic where the, the people said, oh, $35, but you ended up leaving the place, you would have left the place owing $200. Or and trust me, you wouldn't have owed them, you would have paid them to get the, the uh, care. Uh, there's no incentives offered to the uh, to the provider, and so 
they come up with a price that they want to be paid for the health care that they're providing, and you pay the full amount without a pocket payment. Now, sometimes you can negotiate with them and bring it down, but usually whatever it is the doctor wants, that's what you're going to pay. Uh, individual private insurance is when you go out, uh, for instance, with that with the healthcare networks, and you find a healthcare pro uh, insurance provider, and you pay them, and they take care of the insurance. That's usually a little more expensive. Um, the uh, government. Uh, networks that they've come up with are sometimes more affordable depending on your income but uh, it, on in general it tends to be more expensive employer-based private insurance works is usually less expensive because they negotiate for lower costs and the larger the organization the lower the cost te tends to be for the individual. Uh, but And often it will give better, uh, it will give better uh, res payments for things as well. That the copay will be lower uh, on medications and visits to the doctor and to the hospital. Um, one that's not on this list is also organization-based private insurance, uh, which is kind of like an in-between between the individual and employer-based. And so if you belong to certain professional organizations, they often will also have insurance that's available through them that tends to be less expensive than the individual private insurance, but more expensive than an employer-based private insurance. Uh, the government-financed um, health care are things like Medicare, who came up with the DRGs, although the private insurers use the DRGs as well, and Medicaid. So we won't talk a whole lot about this. The healthcare settings include the hospital, primary care centers, ambulatory care centers, and clinics. Those are like your urgent care centers. Uh, home health care. We can have nurses and health care providers uh, like physical therapy or occupational therapy that come to the home to provide care. Um, hospital at home. Uh, tends to be uh, situations where there are, uh, the person has maybe their ventilator dependent or they have increased needs uh, where they are getting higher levels of care at home. Extended care um, tends to be places where, uh, like a nursing, nursing home, and nursing homes are not just for the elderly. They can also be for people that normally live on their own but need some additional rehabilitation before they'll be ready to return to their homes. And so it is, it's not unheard of to find younger people in nursing homes because that's what they're needing at that particular time. Uh, there's specialized care centers and settings like drug rehab places, um, health care services for seriously ill and dying. We talked about that hospice and the, um, uh, the other services that are provided. And then uh, we have various health care agencies as well that provide health care. So the role of nurses in hospitals, obviously the direct care providers are the majority of nurses in hospitals. Um, there's we can be the manager of other 
um, members of health of the healthcare team, uh, administers, administrators. Um, uh, I'll tell you, administrators, they go to one meeting after another all day long. You think uh, it, it gets boring, um, but it, it's still something that needs to be done. Nurse practitioners, um, like myself, where I would go in and see my patients, write orders for them for the day, and uh, make plans as far as their general care. And usually I had a plan that uh, was well beyond my, my one day uh, for their care. The clinical nurse specialists uh, are nurses that have increased education in one area of nursing and uh, provide education and support to both the patients and to the um, staff for education. Um, they are a specific area. They are usually master's prepared or doctoral prepared nurses. And they also have certification as clinical nurse specialists and they also are licensed as advanced practice nurses as a clinical nurse specialist. Uh, the patient educator is someone who comes and does specific or either comes to the room or has patients that comes to them for specific healthcare education. Uh, and the ones that I think of right off the top of my head are diabetes educators. Those are usually RNs that are doing that. An in-service educator is often known as a clinical nurse educator. Uh, and that is what I was doing just before I took this job. And like I told you previously, it's where you uh, plan educational activities for the nurses uh, that are working within the hospital. And then there's researchers. And their primary role is to do research uh, within the hospital. The role of the nurse in primary care centers, uh, often we have advanced um, prime Advanced Practice Registered Nurses, or APRNs, and a nurse practitioner, and uh, could be midwives that are seeing pregnant women and clinical nurse specialists. They work independently or collaboratively with physicians. Uh, it used to be that nurse practitioners and midwives had to work under the auspices of physicians. That depends on the State uh, Nurse Practice Act, whether that is required or not. In many states now, advanced practice nurses are able to work independently without a physician agreement and uh, care for, for patients independently. Uh, on the other hand, in some cases, there are hospitals that will not allow nurse practitioners to admit to the hospital, although they may have nurse practitioners that work as hospitalists within the hospital. So it's kind of, it's an evolving role that changes, sometimes it feels like on a daily basis. Um, So I mentioned a little bit about home health care, and it can be provided uh, through community health departments, visiting nurses associations, hospital-based case managers, and home health agencies, although I would say the majority of them are, are uh, through home health agencies. Uh, it is one of the most rapidly growing areas in the healthcare system. 
uh, and it's being driven by reimbursements from the hospitals. Uh, basically, the longer somebody's in the hospital, the longer, the higher the bill is going to be, and hospitals are trying to keep it within that bundled amount that they're going to get paid, and so they want those patients out of the hospital. Well, one way to get them out is to have them being followed by home health after they get home. Uh, some of the services include skilled nursing assessment, teaching and support of patients and family members, and direct care of patients. Uh, often, the nurse also helps to coordinate care with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and, uh, and other uh, allied health professionals. So I mentioned earlier about how extended care facilities may be um, helping to care for people that are in a transitional uh, situation. So it's not just the elderly, although most people tend to think about that with extended care facilities. And it, um, it, it provides intermediate and long-term care. Uh, there are some places that are homes for medically fragile children, although I have to say that in, mo in many cases, families want their kids home with them, and so what they end up getting is home health care for their medically fragile child, although it depends on the support systems and financial um, capabilities of family, whether that's something that they're doing versus having them in a medically uh, fragile uh, home. Uh, I know that uh, in Kentucky there is a place where it's for ventilator-dependent patients, and so they have a few children that are in that facility, but it also has um, adults that are there as well. Uh, there's also residential institutions for the mentally or physically disabled, um, although I would say that there's less of those than there once was because we really have gotten to a place where we are trying to bring disabled people out into the mainstream, that they tend to do much better uh, long term when mainstreamed into the general population. And then, of course, we have the aged, aging uh, adults that go to extended care uh, because their care becomes too high tech um, or there's so much of it involved that the family is unable to provide that care. And so they need more medically uh, aimed care than what can be provided in the home. Some of the specialized care uh, centers and settings include daycare centers. Uh, some of the daycare centers uh, provide some health uh, screenings like hearing vi and vision screenings. Um, there may be mental health centers that um, may be outpatient centers for people with uh, mental health concerns. Uh, there's rural health centers. So we talked about the other day how there may be situations where there's 150 square miles between um, and one doctor in that area. So the rural health centers may be places where that doctor comes one or two days a week to provide health care for that, those small rural communities. Uh, schools are becoming more health care uh, providers as well, with many of the public school um, schools having uh, school nurses 
available that are doing screenings, and in some cases, even providing health care in the schools. Industry has occupational health nurses that uh, help to make sure that safety uh, is being considered in caring for the employees, as well as treating injuries as they happen. Uh, there's homeless uh, centers. Um, some of the homeless centers are providing uh, health care uh, in for those homeless people. Uh, there are also uh, organizations that are taking out mobile centers to homeless centers or to areas where the homeless tend to congregate to provide dental and other uh, health care. Uh, there's rehabilitation centers where somebody may have had um, surgery that affected their mobility and this is the center is going to help them to be able to use adaptive equipment or to rehab back to um, the ability to walk or move um, freely. Uh, also there's parish nursing and parish nursing is kind of an interesting concept and it varies from organization to organization how much care they provide but it's provided within the auspices of a church where nurses volunteer to provide care. So we see that like with the Hope Center uh, uh, in Cleburne. We talked a little bit um, the other day about hospice and palliative care and uh, nursing is definitely involved in those those areas. Uh, respite care is kind of an in, another interesting um, aspect of that and it has to do with the fact that when you have a family member that is getting a lot of high-tech care uh, you need a rest and especially if as the family member you are providing most of the care to your family member. It's tiring. You never really get any good rest yourself. And so these family members need rest. And so respite care allows for someone to come into the home and provide the care for that family member while the family is able to take a short vacation or sometimes it's a matter they come into the home and provide care long enough for somebody to go out and do their grocery shopping or um, in some cases it may be that if somebody is, has Alzheimer's or some other mental health disorder they may go and spend the morning at a and act, um, a center where there's activities designed for people with those disabilities in order to uh, allow the family member to work. And so uh, there's a lot of um, ways that respite care can be provided. Uh, when I lived in, in Canada, we had a patient that would come in every summer and be admitted into the PEDS ICU and she had a disorder where she was ventilator dependent. And um, it allowed for her mother to have some time off just to gather herself together so that she was able to provide care the rest of the year. And uh, so what they would do is they would take that opportunity for them to do her, her tests and do follow-ups and things like that during this visit that she was there. And she was usually there for a couple weeks while the family went on vacation and then uh, her mom would come pick her up and they'd take her back, back home again. So respite care can be done in numerous ways.
When we look at healthcare agencies, there's voluntary agencies. These are often support groups um, like uh, Alcoholic and Alcoholics Anonymous. It may be the American Heart Association, uh, the uh, March of Dimes, other agencies that provide support for people that are having specific uh, disease states or problems. Uh, other government agencies like the Public Health Service um, monitors the health of a community and the, and the country as a whole. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, provides education as well as support for outbreaks of uh, various diseases. Um, as you know, here in, here in Texas, we've had West Nile coming up. Well, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention keeps track of those cases of West Nile disease and also is doing research on how to prevent it. And then we have other public health agencies like um, the uh, county uh, health departments and uh, the WIC organ uh, organization or the WIC program within the health department that helps meet needs of the population. One of the major things that I want to talk to you guys about is the fact that we do collaborative care. Uh, we work with the physicians, we work with physicians assistants, we work with other nurses, we work with unlicensed assistive personnel like techs or nurses aides, we work with nurse practitioners, we work with uh, physical, occupational and respiratory therapists, dietitians, speech pathologists, social workers, pharmacists, chaplains, they're all part of the team. And in many cases, um, there are cases where people are not appreciative of the work that other uh, professions provide within this team, or they're unaware of the roles of these different um, therapists. And so I want to encourage you as you are meeting these people to ask questions, find out about their, their role in the healthcare team, what they do, how they do it. Um, my first class in uh, my doctoral program was about um, integration within the intraprofessional team. And uh, I found that there were a lot of assignments about conflict in the interprofessional team. And uh, it was disturbing to me on one level because I've always had very good relationships with the other members of the healthcare team. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't show up to do their uh, therapy at a time that was not uh, convenient for me and my patient, but in general, uh, if I would say, oh, I just got the baby to sleep, can we go at another time? Then they would say, sure, uh, you know, I've got time here and here, uh, when can I come back? So develop good working relationships within the healthcare team. So here's some of the trends that we need to watch in healthcare delivery. For one thing, we're looking at changes in demographics. And we talked a little bit about that in the cultural lecture that we had yesterday, that um, the majority, or what's been considered the majority in the past, is soon to become the minority um, racially in this country and ethnically in this country. Um, there's increasing diversity, uh, and that is also part of this change in the minorities and majorities uh, in the country. 
there's a great technology explosion. Healthcare changes on, it really feels like a daily basis because of the technology that we have now compared to what we had even five to 10 years ago. The globalization of the economy and society also means that we're seeing things in healthcare that we've never seen in the past. Uh, if you think about the fact that Ebola has always been in Africa until we had somebody who had been exposed to it and didn't realize it until um, they came into our country and then started having signs of Ebola. And so we're seeing diseases in our country that we've not seen before. Uh, Zika virus is another one where Zika virus has been down in South America, but now it's moved up into the United States as well. Uh, education and uh, in engaged consumers, we are doing a great job, uh, or not as well as we could be, but we are definitely headed in the right direction in educating our patients and, and other uh, people who use health care to help them understand what needs to be done in health care. We're seeing increased complexity in patient care because we're not seeing these relatively healthy patients that are just coming in for day surgery and staying in for a couple days. Those day surgeries are done in day, day surgery centers. They come in in the morning, they have their surgery, they go home at the end. So we're, we're seeing more complex patients on our floors. In the old days, some of the patients that we see on the floor would have been ICU patients. Now they're out on the floor. The cost of health care is going to be an issue that's going to have to be addressed. And we're going to see changes in health policy and regulations related to the costs in health care. We're starting to see shortages in key health care professionals and educators. Like I mentioned to you, nurses are aging. And the population of nurses, half of us are going to retire in the next 15 years. I sure hope I am in the next 15 years. So it's something that we're, uh, we're going to need to address so that we have people to take their places, someone to educate the, new gen the next generations of nurses. Some of the ethical and moral questions that we have about health care are things like, do people who engage in risky behaviors or who don't make necessary lifestyle changes deserve the same health care as people who live healthy lives? And who should pay for the health care needed by the unemployed and the homeless? And actually, if you want to take that, who should pay for the health care of these people that are engaging in risky behaviors? Should they pay more for their health care than somebody who lives a healthier life? Is someone who pays for national television coverage to ask for an organ donation for their child any more deserving than somebody who's been waiting for months on a transplant list? Uh, and I can give you examples of that that I'd rather not have out in a public forum. And so let's you know, these are things that as a society uh, we have to address and decide what's, what's ethical in the care of uh, patients. Some of the other questions that we might ask as well are, should citizens pay higher insurance premiums or, have, or taxes so that a drug addict who overdoses can have intensive care? Are you willing to pay for somebody else's care? Should undocumented workers in the United States have the same access to health care as U.S. citizens? You know, that's definitely something that's in the news right now. And if 20 people need a heart transplant and there's only one heart available, who decides who gets another chance of life and who should make those decisions?
So as you can see, nurses have a lot of things going on in healthcare and it affects both our work life and it affects how we deal within the organizations that we work in. Uh, there's changes taking place that give us an opportunity to help shape healthcare for the future. We're becoming a stronger voice in addressing health-related problems locally and on a national level. And nurses in greater numbers are increasing their education and becoming APRNs. I do want to make a, a comment about that because um, over the last few years as I've been teaching, I talk to students coming in and they go, and I want to be a nurse practitioner. Well, if everyone who came into nursing who wants to go on and become nurse practitioners became nurse practitioners, eventually we would be at a point where there would be so many nurse practitioners that there wouldn't be jobs for them to do. And not only would there not, and if there's no jobs for them to do, that means that we would end up with nurse practitioners at the bedside doing uh, basic nursing care. That's not to say that I'm discouraging you from going into the role of a nurse practitioner, but what it does mean is that we have to look at why are people going in and becoming nurse practitioners, and also um, how many how many nurse practitioner programs do we need? How many nurse practitioners do we need? And how is that uh, goal of students going into nursing programs to eventually become nurse practitioners, how is that affecting nursing as a whole and the ability to give quality nursing care at the bedside? And so it's definitely a question that nursing needs to be looking at. Uh, I think the one thing that I found somewhat offensive was we didn't start becoming BSN prepared nurses until the Institute of Medicine told us that we needed to do it. We as nurses did not make that decision. Medicine made it for us. And so I think nursing needs to take responsibility and uh, act on these issues before some other profession tells us what they think we should be doing. The focus on nursing care provided by all nurses is holistic care, and it's essential to promoting health and preventing illness. One of the major advantages of nursing and APRNs is that the nursing model is holistic. We look at the whole person when we're looking at their care, not just, oh, you've come in with a bad cold, or, oh, you have a stomach ache. Let me treat your stomach ache. We look at them as a whole to see if there might be some other reason why they're experiencing the health problem that they're having. So to me, it is a much more inclusive way of looking at my, my patients than the PAs or the physicians in their models. And that concludes this lecture. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys soon.